Good evening and welcome to the second webinar in our new series for education professionals, Classroom Strategies and Accommodations for Students with Tourette Syndrome. My name is Angela Sullivan, Medical Project Manager, and I will be your moderator this evening. This webinar is being provided as part of the Tourette Health and Education Program, a program of the Tourette Association of America, in partnership with the CDC. During the webinar, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You might ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at, at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I would like to mention that funding for this webinar was made possible by our cooperative agreement with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views expressed by speakers and moderators do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does the mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. Governor, government. This webinar has been accredited for one contact hour for psychologists and social workers. For more information on how to claim your credit, please download the learner notification document that's located in the handouts section of the control panel. In order to receive your certificate, you must participate in the entire webinar and follow the instructions on that document. You will also receive a follow-up email within an hour after the webinar closes out with instructions about claiming your credit and where to do so. The slides for the presentation, along with a few other TAA educational toolkits, are available for download in the handout section as well. Before we get started, I want to briefly introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Jennifer Stenger. She has been, a public, been in public education for 20, over 20 years now, first as a high school English teacher and currently as a school counselor. She has also taught adjunct classes at two universities in Southern Illinois. In 2011, she received a PhD in educational leadership and policy studies from the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Her dissertation research was based on other public K through 12 educators who like herself have Tourette syndrome. After completing her doctorate, she self-published The Life That Chose Us, Educators with Tourette Syndrome, based on this work. She, since publishing in 2013, she has presented at multiple conferences and speaking engagements. She also meets with younger children with disabilities to promote positive self-image and self-confidence. She is energized when working with and serving the TS community, and she's driven to help school-age children succeed both academically and socially. Jen also serves on the TAA's Education Advisory Board since 2016. Thank you so much for being with us, Jen. And without further ado, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. So today's presentation are very simple classroom strategies and accommodations that we can use um, to help our students with Tourette syndrome be successful in the classroom. So if you're an, an educator, or in the education world or a parent or a family member of somebody with Tourette, I feel like all these strategies could be useful. You can take them back to your school. Um, and they're just things that I have done over the years and um, from research that, that it's very simple strategies. So I'm gonna just dive into my slides. So here we go. Um, I'm gonna start with an overview, just kind of a brief overview. Of, oh, sorry, of Tourette syndrome. So, and we're going to talk about the prevalence of Tourette syndrome and other tick disorders and how that impacts students with Tourette syndrome. Um, from there, we're going to talk about the potential impact of co occurring conditions and how they can affect classroom performance many times more than the ticks themselves. And then we'll end with some simple classroom strategies and techniques for working with students who have Tourette syndrome. So first off, kind of just a, a brief overview of Tourette syndrome. And research shows that one out of 160 children between the ages of five and 17 in the United States has Tourette syndrome. Um, about one out of every children has Tourette syndrome or another tick disorder. However, it's estimated that, oh, my slide's a little bit so I can see everything. Um, it's estimated that another 50% could go undiagnosed in the community. So um, obviously it is um, impacting our, our school-aged children for sure. 
So the neurodevelopmental aspect of it, ticks are typically noticed when a child is between the ages of five and seven. Ticks typically increase in frequency and severity when a child is eight to 12. Um, most people with Tourette syndrome show noticeable improvement in late adolescence and some even become tick free. Um, I would definitely be in this, this last bullet point. Uh, one, approximately one quarter of people with Tourette syndrome continue to have persistent um, or severe ticks or into adulthood. And so I definitely, my ticks, I would say, are not as um, intense as when I was in high school in my 20s, but I definitely still have ticks. Oh, sorry. Okay, so ticks. Involuntary repetitive movements, movements and vocalizations. Um, it feels like uh, the urge is you have this this urge and it's very difficult to ignore it or suppress it. And in fact, when you actually do tick, it provides only a temporary relief from the urge. Um, that little bullet point to the side or um, text box, it sort of feels like when you have to sneeze, you know you have to, and it's all you can think about until you actually do sneeze. Another uh, kind of example I give is it's like a mosquito bite. You know, you, you can see that you've got that mosquito bite on your arm and you know you shouldn't scratch it, but then the more you think about it, the more it starts to itch and itch and itch, and you um, eventually have to scratch it. Um, ticks can range from mild to severe, and they can be self-injurious and debilitating. And ticks regularly change in the type, frequency, and severity. So they definitely um, change throughout um, one's life and even you know, from day to day and week to week. So there are two types of ticks. Um, we have motor ticks and vocal ticks. So simple motor ticks usually involve just one group of muscles. Examples, eye blinking, jaw movements, uh, shoulder shrugging, neck stretching or jerking, and arm jerking. Complex motor tics then involve <clears throat> multiple muscle groups and a combination of movements. So examples are hopping, jumping, sticking out your tongue, kissing, tearing of paper or books. Vocal tics, we have both severe vocal tics and complex vocal tics. So simple vocal tics, um, aren't even words. So sometimes people automatically think you've got to say something with a vocal tick, but examples of sniffing, throat clearing, grunting, hooting, and shouting. Um, I remember I, I did a, like a sniffing um, through my nose when I was in elementary school, middle school, high school, and I still sometimes will do <clears throat> throat clearing or coughing when I know I don't really, I'm not ill, I don't have to cough. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sick. So complex vocal tics are then words or phrases that may or may not be recognizable. Um, they can occur in and out of context. So that can be difficult um, you know, in the classroom because sometimes you might be um, giving a lecture. I remember the very first time I spoke at the Tourette conference and I was giving a presentation to some of the youth on the youth track and it, it was hard to focus because sometimes based on the context of what I would say, they would have vocal tics back to me. And so I know sometimes teachers, it can be frustrating and, and, and we'll talk about that in another um, section slides coming up. Um, most people or the, the majority of people when you talk about vocal tics, they think of coprolalia. Um, unfortunately, the me media of course has sensationalized that. That's the one big point that people think, oh, it's, it's cuss words or um, obscene or inappropriate derogatory remarks. Um, actually, 10 to 12, less than 10, only it's 10% or so. I, I've seen 10 to 12, I've seen eight, but it, it's usually right around 10% only um, people with Tourette syndrome have the coprolalia. And then there's echolalia and paleolalia as well. So as I started to say, it can be difficult with complex symptoms because it can be difficult to recognize, support, and understand, especially those that happen in context. Um, symptoms can change and they definitely wax and wane. And a couple of things that usually makes ticks worse. worse. Stress, everything with stress in our lives kind of makes everything worse that's going on in our lives. So stress definitely increases symptoms um, and symptoms can be suggestible. Also, lack of sleep. 
Um, so if you're tired, if you're you know just worn out, your tics can tend to be worse for sure. The ability to suppress symptoms is inconsistent and for most people, and it can vary from one person to the next. I remember, you know, um, in high school and college, I could be a bridesmaid in a wedding, and I feel like I could do a fairly decent job of standing up in front of the church and and no one really noticing me, although it, it required a, a great amount of effort and concentration. And I feel like um, I was definitely drained afterwards. You know, like it's, it can be physically exhausting and we'll talk about that um, and how it affects kids in the classroom as well when they're trying to suppress tics. And that's, that's the main thing on your mind. That's what you're focusing on. So you're really not getting at all 100% of that lecture or that you know read aloud or whatever's going on in the classroom because the focus is you're trying to you know not make not be a distraction and not tick in the classroom so it can definitely um, have an impact on academic success um, and again students will will be struggling to manage their symptoms of Tourette syndrome and as well as their co the co-occurring conditions or both and so definitely. It can be a lot of other things going on in their mind than just focusing on the teacher or, or what the task at hand in school. So here is some data on students in our schools that have Tourette syndrome. Children with Tourette syndrome are four times as likely to have at least one co-occurring condition compared to a student without Tourette syndrome. And in fact, when we look at just our school-aged children with, with Tourette syndrome, 80% of them have at least one other co-occurring condition. Um, they're much more likely to have a mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder. Um, and the most common, the most prevalent are ADHD, OCD, and LD. Those are the most common uh, co-occurring conditions. However, students with Tourette syndrome also have more difficulty controlling anger, trouble sleeping, higher levels of self-interest behaviors than, than those with non-co-occurring conditions. And it's a double-edged sword, you know, if I just said a minute ago how lack of sleep can make your tics worse, and many people with Tourette syndrome have trouble sleeping or even, um, you know, struggle with insomnia on and off for their whole lives. So when you never are, you never have a great night's sleep, you know, you're never going on eight hours of sleep like your typical um, so student, let's, let's hope they get eight hours of sleep or adult, you know, it can be difficult because you're always struggling with being tired. And then sometimes the stress of, man, I, I, I'm, I didn't get enough sleep. I'm worried about ticking. And, and then it just kind of adds on to each other, all piles up. So this is the reason that we need some school-based interventions. We do know that children with Tourette syndrome are being educated in both the mainstream and the special education um, sections of our schools. So, while all students that have all students with Tourette syndrome don't need special education services, they do need specific educational interventions um, when these things are happening. If a student is falling behind academically, if their tics are so severe that they interfere with the student's learning or even the student's ability to participate in the classroom. Um, if the student is having difficulties with peer relationships, and then, of course, if the self is usually when all of these um, are happening, then the self esteem is definitely um, in danger also. So, when these things happen, that's when we want to bring in these school based interventions to help. Um, you know, support the child to be successful academically. Social, social emotional concerns. Difficulties in school impact both academic performance and a child's social adjustment. adjustment. From seven to 12, ticks have the greatest effect on a child's self-esteem as well as his peer and even his family relationships. Due to the negativity associated with the presence of tics, teasing by classmates can lead to social difficulty and anxiety in social situations. And this will um, oftentimes cause a, a, a child, student with Tourette syndrome to withdraw socially and to experience depression, low self-esteem, and a lack of self-confidence. 
So the co-occurring conditions. You may have seen this next slide before. I just love this slide. Um, it just really depicts what we can't see what we can't see visually. So physically, we can see the vote, the motor ticks and the vocal ticks, right? And that's just at the tip of the iceberg. Um, underneath the water, what we cannot see are all these possible co-occurring conditions. Um, and like I said, 80% of, of students with Tourette syndrome have at least one of these. So dysgraphia, which is handwriting difficulties, um, obsessive compulsive behaviors, ADHD, anxiety, impulsivity, rage, other um, behavior is issues such as disinhibition, uh, social, communi de social communication deficits, um, executive functioning, just to name, I don't think I even hit all of them, but there, there are all these other issues that a child might be trying to manage during the school day, um, and you're seeing the vocal tics and the motor tics, but he, um, you know, they're struggling with these other issues as well. So let's first talk about OCD, or as we like to sometimes refer to it as OCB, um, Tourette's OCB. So classic obsessive compulsive disorder is when an individual symptoms are linked to ritual compulsion behaviors in attempt to manage that anxiety and fear um, that the that they are experiencing related to these obsessions. So an example, uh, a person who checks all the windows and the doors in their house three times before they go to bed at night because they are just convinced if if they accidentally leave one of those unlocked that some something bad's going to happen, somebody's going to break in and hurt and and hurt them. So that is the classic OCD. Tourette's OCD um, is the symptoms are more closely tied to um, an individual's experience of tics. And you might hear somebody say that they just need to do something over and over again until they say it, um, or they do it, or it feels just right, okay? So you have to do it sometimes at a given time uh, or um, until it feels just right. And this behavior is driven by those urges, you know, those physiological urges which cause us to tick rather than by a fear. I read once a um, very um, prof a professional basketball player, and he used to um, go to the locker room and have to get ready about 45 minutes before all of his other teammates because he would take on and put off his shoes. He would take them on and off until they just felt just right because he couldn't practice or he couldn't play until, his, it, until it felt right. And I always give this example of myself, it's also related to basketball, funny enough. Um, in elementary school, we had a basketball hoop in our driveway and my sister and I would go out and shoot hoops, you know, shoot baskets after school, just messing around. And if you've ever dribbled basketball, I was not a very good dribbler. And I would sometimes dribble the ball off one of my, uh, off my foot. And so when the, when the ball hits your foot, it's gonna just roll into the road or roll into the grass. It's not gonna bounce back up at you. and um, I would always go back, you know, chase the ball, and then I'd dribble it a couple more times, and I would have to bounce it off my other foot because it just didn't feel right. I couldn't just bounce it off one foot and not off the other foot. And my sister just kind of knew this. Like, um, this was way before I was ever diagnosed with Tourette syndrome, but she knew from us playing basketball long enough that I would have to inadvertently bounce it off my other foot. So she would wait, and then we'd start playing our game again. And um, so that's my example of the Tourette OCD. Um, Tourette syndrome, I'm sorry, o OCD is far more common in children and adults with Tourette syndrome than without Tourette syndrome. Um, again, you might have that urge to do and redo activities till they look just right, feel just right, or, or sound just right. Others may be distracted by impulsive thoughts and desires to perform compulsive behaviors. Um, the other others have difficulty transitioning from one task to the other because they have they don't feel that this first task has been finished. So, um, you know, sometimes I know somebody who had um, a child in elementary school and there were a bunch of pe pencils on the library table, and so she started to line them up row by row. But then when they were getting ready to go, like she was trying to line them up just right symmetrical and, and her parents were wanting to leave, but she hadn't finished. You know, there were more pencils on the table and, and she just didn't feel like this was 
the task hadn't been finished, so she couldn't leave until she had finished that. Sensory processing disorder. Some students with threat syndrome also have sensory issues and they may experience or exhibit the following. So some students feel overwhelmed by too much sensory input or loud um, chaotic environments. And you can imagine how difficult this can be for students in, in, a, in a school setting, right? So the cafeteria, um, recess, I didn't put on here, but think of the bus, riding to and from school on the bus, and the PE, music, and art rooms, that can just be too much for some of our students. Also, some need excessive sensory input, and those are the kids that are gonna be purposely bumping into desks, or purposely bumping their shoulder up on a wall, or putting their hands in, in things. Um, chewing on clothes or body. It's always interesting to me as an adult when I research um, about Tourette syndrome because I see things that I did in elementary school and junior high that, although I know I did those, I never associated them with my tics or with having Tourette syndrome. And one example that I never really thought of um, until I started working on, on this presentation, this webinar, was when I was in um, junior high and I'd be taking notes like in social studies class, I would take the, the tip of my, the cap of my pen and I'd be taking notes probably, but I'd be chewing on the, the, the cap of the pen or my pencils would have just bite marks all over them and the pen caps would be mangled and I, I'd be writing notes, but I was always biting on my pens, my pencils and the caps of the pens. So um, I, I never really associated that with, with my Tourette syndrome until very recently. Other sensory processing disorders involves excessive touching, hitting, hurting, um, hurting self, jumping, or kicking. And, and that can be touching, hitting self or others. And an occupational therapist in a school setting is great because they can help come up with a sensory plan individual to each student. Executive function challenges are difficult. Um, uh, many, many students struggle with executive function. And these are, so executive function is a set of mental processes that helps connect past experiences with present, what we're doing in the present action. So it enables individuals to do things such as planning, organizing, strategizing, paying attention to detail, remembering detail, all while managing time and space. So imagine how difficult it is to write an essay if you have um, executive function challenges, right? They just can't, they, it's too big of a picture. Like they can't get past that, that opening paragraph to see how they're going to, you know, and, and it just leads to roadblocks. It leads to assignments never getting done. So um, you, can, you can support students with executive function challenges challenges by helping them with transitions. Um, I also think if you can write it down, teachers, we know that we can say something eight, 10 times. We can even write it on the whiteboard, but a student is still gonna ask us, what are we doing next or what are we doing tomorrow? So if you can give them a, a, a little half sheet of paper and have them be able to have it right there at their desk, they can look at it, they can check things off as they go. It's just one easy thing that helps the kid and it's gonna help you know, your patients because you're not, you know, you're not gonna have to repeat something um, eight, 10 times or more. Beginning and completing tasks and assignments. Um, lots of students will begin and even finish assignments, but they lose them before they're going to turn them in the next day. So if you can um, collect it before they leave or, uh, you know, some kids would have folders in the classroom. They never took anything home with them because we knew it wouldn't come back. So um, lots of strategies to help them, you know, not with just beginning the assignments, but, but completing them and then also getting them termed in. Remembering what to do decreasing rigidity, um, recognizing that there are other opinions than theirs, and, and that's okay. This all, all of these will support somebody with these challenges and helps them develop lifelong strategies. Anxiety. I kind of feel like after the pandemic, how many, who hasn't experienced some type of anxiety in their lives? You know, whether you are diagnosed with anxiety, it's just been a, a very uncertain time. Um, 
but anxiety definitely has a cumulative effect during the day. So a student with Tourette syndrome is trying to manage their tics, sometimes probably trying to suppress their tics and other co-occurring challenges. So they're worried about, um, you know, behavior, disinhibition, uh, dysgraphia, they're having trouble writing down their assignments and things just build and build and build. So if these students have not um, been sufficiently supported in, in how to regulate, how to uh, acknowledge their level of anxiety and manage that anxiety, there often, unfortunately, is an undesirable re reaction and an outcome. So in the high school world, we kind of call that a student acting out in class for elementary um, or even our, our toddlers, we call that a meltdown, right? So it's just when there's too much going on and you know they just can't take it anymore. So we try to work with students to recognize that when they are overloaded and, and give them simple strategies that they can use to reduce their anxiety. And part of that, sometimes the biggest piece is helping students recognize when they are you know, when that emotional base we kind of, we talk about when, when they are getting overwhelmed and, and when they are getting overloaded so that there are some things that they can do to take a moment to kind of bring that anxiety back down. Um, and anxiety, clinical anxiety or sub, subclinical just stress can definitely both exacerbate tics. Written language deficits, um, a lot of Students with Tourette syndrome suffer from dysgraphia or, or lang written language deficits. And this could be slow and laborious writing, sloppy handwriting. It could be uneven spacing, irregular margins, inconsistent with their lettering, uh, incorrect capitalization, punctuation, inability to cor um, correctly copy from either the book to the paper or from the board to the paper inability to organize thoughts on paper, and perfectionism also. Um, so to, to best evaluate this, you can have a student write at length on a non-favorite topic during a time of day that is typically difficult for them. For most students, that's in the afternoon, right? At the end of the day, when they're either tired, they could be, um, if they had some type of sugary drink at lunch, you know, that they've got that, that caffeine or that sugar in them. So um, to have them write on a non-favorite topic and, and that's the best way to kind of get an analyzation of dysgraphia. This slide just goes to show, we talked about Tourette syndrome and how um, it's unique to each person. Obviously ticks are different, ticks change over the lifetime and the co-occurring conditions. This shows how um, students with Tourette syndrome all may suffer from dysgraphia, but for different reasons. So writing by hand could be difficult for that student with a learning disability because of motor issues, uh, for the student with OCD because of uh, intensity of focus or the desire for perfection. You know, there can't be any misspelled words and I can't just write a, draw a line through it and keep going. They have to start all over brand new piece of paper, start from the beginning. So that's that's one way. And for students with ADHD, it could be because of a lack of focus and distractibility. So here are, this is the importance of um, a supportive teacher and how they can help make a difference. In a qualitative study of students, and qualitative study is just so um, quantitative, quantitative is, is numbers, surveys, Qualitative is, is speaking, talking to one another, so many times interviews. So in a qualitative study, um, students, it was found that children who had Tourette syndrome were happiest and most successful when they felt that their teachers were understanding and respectful to their feelings and their needs. Uh, teachers create a safe and caring environment, classroom environment, where, where students are not going to feel threatened or ostracized. Um, I, I truly believe that only when students feel safe do they truly learn. Um, teachers can help create that environment by using person-first language. So person-first language is always you are, you are humanizing the person. So I am a person with Tourette syndrome. I'm an educator with Tourette syndrome. Um, you might talk about a person who uses a wheelchair, not a disabled person. You don't put the adjective in front of, 
of the, the person. So you, you humanize who they are. Uh, teachers definitely model acceptance and support. All are valued here. This is our classroom. Everybody's important. Everybody is safe here. And key, uh, teachers definitely are key in educating classmates using age appropriate language and examples. For, for instance, I once spoke in a fourth grade classroom um, with a little boy who had Tourette syndrome and then I kind of, the, I spoke, it was a smaller school. The other fourth grade classroom had his uh, step siblings. So I spoke in both of those classrooms and just using language that fourth graders can understand. You know, uh, we talked about Tourette syndrome and then I said, so, you know, you can't catch Tourette syndrome by playing with Michael. You know, it's not like you, you catch a cold from somebody, you know, you uh, it's just we talked about some of the things he does and, and how that's just him. But he's just like you and he's just like you and everybody else in the classroom. Knowledge is power. I've always said this. I think this is so huge. Education is key. A lack of knowledge about Tourette syndrome just usually creates negative attitudes or questions, because when I say education is key, if we don't talk about things for littler kids, they sometimes tend to think, why aren't we talking about this? Well, we don't talk about things that are bad. This must be bad. And obviously that's not at all the, the, you know, the persona that we want, want children to have. Um, and sometimes I think we, we think we're, we would make a student uncomfortable if we talk about it, but it it's kind of has that reverse effect. If, if nobody talks about it, then there's questions and sometimes feelings of shame, like we can't talk about this. Also, um, I have found when I started teaching, I did not disclose to my students that I had Tourette syndrome. Um, and, and they saw my tics very early on, you know, but it was never talked about. So obviously for them, it's, it was confusing to them. I don't understand why we're not talking about this. And for high school kids especially, what do you tend to do when you don't understand something? Well, students tend to make a joke about something because it makes people laugh, it lightens the mood. This is uncomfortable, I don't know why we're not talking about this. So um, I've, I've seen that once you just give kids the knowledge up front, kids are so resilient and they take it in stride and then they're really ready to move on to the next thing. You give them the information and they're gonna process it and, and they're, gonna, they're gonna be fine with it. So I found also with classmates, when they're informed about Tourette syndrome, they are gonna be more tolerant and more supportive of, of students with Tourette syndrome. And this definitely contributes to a reduction in teasing, bullying and avoidance by classmates. And then, after um, you know the teacher is supportive, once we educate those peers, peers then can can help also. Um, knowledge creates that care and concern and acceptance of everyone. Um, that empathy. We all have something. So when I did start disclosing in my classroom, you know, I would talk about. So I have Tourette syndrome, and obviously that's that's pretty visible. You can all see that. But there's probably everybody in here struggling with something. Many of them things that we can't see. You know, um, somebody could be grieving the loss of a um, somebody close to them, a loved one, and and definitely you don't see that, but it has a profound effect on on people. So after classmates have been educated, they in turn can help educate others. Substitute teachers or secretaries, new students, the bus driver, cafeteria, anyone who comes in into the school. I always remember it used to be. I was always, I wouldn't say the worst thing, but I always did not like getting a transfer student. Like, so in January is the new semester, is the start of the new semester. And then if I would get a kid in the end of March, um, because I felt like um, even when I wasn't disclosing to my, my students, we kind of got a routine. We got, we understood, like everybody was used to me. And then a, a kid would come into the classroom and I might do something and I could see him looking like, what is she doing with her arm? You know, and I will, I will never forget one little girl in one of my sophomore classes leaned over and said to him, she just has Tourette's, it's no big deal. And it was just a great example of how kids are definitely take things in, in stride. And, and this is a good example of how they can, you know, help inform others and, and, and teach others. So we talked earlier about how I understand that it can sometimes be trying as a teacher if, if a child with Tourette syndrome 
is doing something and you know just kind of it's one of those days where you're frustrated and you're frustrated and sometimes you can even think wow it's almost like he's doing this just to get under my skin like he's doing this deliberately um and i really think these next two slides are a great example of how important perception is and how if we can just shift our perception of how we view anything a student in this case a student it totally changes our attitude so i'm going to start with the negative perception of a child with tourette syndrome so if you have that negative perception on that day this student is a problem he is the problem and you might be thinking um, as a as a teacher this student is deliberately trying to get the class riled up he is being disrespectful to me and he's doing all you know he's doing this on purpose he's being mean and when you feel that way and it can be difficult especially when some of those vocal tics are in context so they are related to the discussion or what's going on in class and when you think these things as a teacher you definitely feel threatened right you feel like the classroom is going to get out of control you're feeling angry and when you feel that way you tend to react um you know in a punitive manner manner you're going to offer an ultimatum or you're going to punish somebody and so if you can just shift that sh shift your perception into okay this student has a problem and when you think about that um, if it is a, a bad day for this kid you might think wow sally is really ticking a lot today i bet she is so frustrated she's got to be so discouraged um, things were a lot better earlier in the week i bet she is really unhappy right now and of course as a teacher when we think things like that we feel concern and and empathy and so then of course we want to support that student we want to encourage them to keep going it's going to tomorrow's going to be a better better day and to help them um so it really is you know makes a huge difference if you can just shift how you're perceiving things and i love sharing this story um i spoke once at i did an in service at a middle school and I, I shared this once. I knew a sixth grade boy. And as we talked about, ticks wax and wane all the time, they change. This little sixth grader got this vocal tick going where he was saying trains, trains all the time in the cafeteria, in the middle of the science lab, whenever he was saying trains. Like by the end of that first week, the teachers were just like, I hear trains one more time. And as ticks, happened to, you know, this is textbook, things kind of shifted or morphed. Somehow this um, tick of trains turned into, now he was saying boobs all the time. So you can imagine you're in a middle school, junior high setting. After about two days of hearing boobs, the teachers were like, we just wish he would go back to saying trains. Trains, are, we can deal with trains, trains are good. So just kind of a, a cute little example of perception. All of a sudden, trains are not so bad. Okay, so here are some strategies that we can use to support students with Tourette syndrome in our classrooms. One, it's as simple as the physical arrangement of the room, just kind of allowing adequate space for that student with Tourette syndrome to move around if he needs to, to let out some ticks. Um, and I always like to have a student's desk on the end of a row so it could be at the very front or it could be in the very back and you know as teachers we're always mixing up our seating charts but i like to always have them on the end and that would really um, just allow i did this in graduate school like i would just kind of scoop my desk out a little bit to the side more so i had more room one of my ticks that i've always done is i jerk my elbows and i'm really tall i'm six foot tall i have long arms like i don't if I hit the table accidentally or hit somebody's desk, it's going to startle them. Um, it startles me sometimes because I don't think I'm going to hit the table. So I, I was always nervous. I didn't want to hit somebody. So I could just, just kind of scoot, angle my desk out a little bit. And I knew I would have a little bit more room. And that always made me feel more comfortable. Have a student seated next to a buddy. You know, we always have those kids that are nurturers. Um, and that they, that they like to help. They can help with note taking, especially if somebody has you know, dysgraphia issues. And sometimes, you know, it might be as simple as knocking things off his desk, you know, and, and somebody can help pick things up. Um, or just to have somebody there to, you know, somebody who is 
a good friend and you know can help out in the classroom. This last one I love, and I do this all the time. I did it and not just with kids with Tourette syndrome, lots of times with my kids that had some hyperactivity um, issues. Um, allow the student to be a helper or an assistant. Ask somebody to erase the board, to pass out papers, collect papers, open the windows, just so that it can move around. Sometimes that little bit of expelling and um, some energy is good. And sometimes, like if they have certain ticks, they can do those easier um, in the classroom when they're moving around. Um, take something to the office. I have made up notes that need to go to the office because really somebody just needed to get to get out for a little bit and and just walk. So I'd be you know write a little note and it would really be nothing significant at all. But it was you know I need this to go to the office. Can you take it for me, please? Um, handwriting accommodations. I feel like because of the pandemic, I think teachers have so many of these. You know, they're doing them with their students, all their students now, or they did them, you know, in, in a, recently. So allow students to type and submit homework electronically if they have trouble writing, even with those sense um, executive functioning, if they're going to lose it. I know many of my teacher friends would say, OK, if you finish this at home tonight, take a picture of it and email it to me. You know, send me a picture of your homework. And that way, if it's not here tomorrow, it'll be in my in my inbox. Um, there's a lot of talk to text software these days that can dictate the spoken word right into a typed document. So that's great if if people just have that, you know, that slow and laborious handwriting, if, if it just takes too much time. Um, somebody, I think this is a good one with executive functioning. You could allow a student with Tourette syndrome to give a verbal response instead of an essay, instead of writing an essay, you know, so have somebody their desk right up to my desk and we can have a conversation about this book or you can you know tell me your thoughts on this play and then finally limiting the number of homework problems to focus on mastering the concept being taught not the quantity and i feel like there are so many teachers that do those this for you know a variety of students you know just work on the odd problems or today you're going to do one through ten Schedules and routines. So ticks are often more severe and frequent when a student is tired, fatigued, or excited. So um, this probably works a little bit better with elementary school, but even, even if you're you know in a high school and you're only, you know, have a kid for one hour at a time, if the lessons and activities that require close attention can be scheduled earlier in the day or first thing in that hour. Um, conversely, activities that are interesting to the student could be scheduled later in the day as ticks tend to decrease when students are engaged in activities that are enjoyable and of interest to them. I'm going to go back for one second. Also with schedules, sometimes um, with the rigidity, sometimes an, a change to scheduling, even if it's something that they like, like a field trip, can throw a kid off. So when possible, if, um, if you can warn, and really this, this works best for all kids, and I, I know lots of my teacher friends that will have long-term plans on the board, you know, whether it's a test coming up in a week or, it, you know, going to the library. If you can announce that a couple of days in advance so they know, okay, today we're not meeting the classroom, we're going to meet in the computer lab, um, just so they see that coming and they have time to, to get ready for that and prepare. Self-calming techniques for students with Tourette syndrome. Um, these are good helps with, um, you know, when they realize that anxiety is too, too much, just doing some of this, just that deep belly breathing. I tell kids sometimes if they start to, you know, their mind blanks on a test, just sit there for a minute, close your eyes, take a couple dig, big, deep breaths, you know, um, count to 10, and then start tackling that test. Deep muscle relaxation, some guided imagery exercises, mindfulness, meditation, um, and, and just taking a break, sometimes stepping away. And that leads me to my next slide, especially um, with kids when their tics can really become so uh, intense that, that they're distracting the student from being able to participate in the class. Um, it's great if the teacher and the student has a special signal worked out ahead of time. 
that they can they can communicate the need to step out in the classroom without even having to verbalize that okay and it works both ways the student can give the signal and sometimes you know some kids don't even recognize that hey maybe i would benefit from a break so the teacher can give the signal sometimes too and then if the kid is like oh yeah i think that is a good idea then just get up and go to that pre-identified area for a few minutes okay and it you can usually have a, a designated time like three to five minutes or if it's more than seven you know i'll send somebody to look for you but the student can then just step away for a, a short break it could be the hallway the gym to the restroom or to get a drink at the water fountain to the counselor's office or a nurse um, it just gives the student a little bit of time to regroup to relieve some of the ticks and, and and relieve some stress and then possibly the occurrence of ticks or just the, a moment to work on some of those stress relieving techniques that we just talked about or kind of some other ones i listed that that i will have students do as a school counselor when somebody is is anxious or or worked up when they come into my office, a squeeze ball or a stress brawl. Um, some people like to draw, or we have a lot of those adult coloring pages. Um, almost everybody has music on their phone, so I'll say, "Do you want to pull something up and put, you know, put your head earbuds in for a minute, uh, take a short walk, or just practicing some of those relaxation exercises such as the belly breathing." Um, so, in a nutshell, um, all of these are accommodations that teachers can use regardless of a, if a student has an IEP or even a 504 plan. These are just little techniques um, in the classroom that, that can help a student feel more comfortable and, um, and help them just kind of gauge their own, their own anxiety, their own um, the way to manage I'm drawing a blank here. Um, just to kind of help them manage their tics and, and learn to advocate for themselves when when they're not so great, when they need to take a break and and step away. So the last few slides, and I believe the slides are going to be emailed to you, and they're attached, I think, to the the email that you got to join the webinar, are just some of the resources that we offer at the Tourette Syndrome um, at the Tourette Association, and that you can contact us for um, more information and Angela I don't know if there have been questions but I would be happy to answer any questions that have come in thank you so much Jen that was such an excellent presentation so as she mentioned we're now going to begin answering the questions that were submitted during the presentation as a reminder you can still submit any questions you have through the questions pane on the control panel if we're unable to get to everyone's questions or you have additional questions that come up after we close the webinar out, here at the TAA, we do have a full-time information and referral staff who would be more than happy to answer your questions as well. And you can contact them by emailing support at Tourette.org or you can give us a call at 1-888-4-Tourette. Um, so just before we get to some other questions, the slides are available in the handout section on the control panel. You can download them um, and I will be sending out a follow up email within the next week or so um, with a copy of the slides so you can access all the resources that were on there. Okay, Jen, we have one question for you. Okay. How, how would I manage texts that are disruptive to teaching and learning? The best, the best, there are lots of resources, but to come up with a plan that is gonna work for the parents and the school and the child. We always say, um, involve the child in, in the decision because they know what works best for them. They know, um, you know what, what issues are gonna come up and they really have the voice that, that we need to hear. Um, I always say as a teacher, involve, involve the parents whether it's a 504 plan or just communication with them. Um, and I've heard, you know, there's the spectrum is so, so broad. I know there, I've heard some kids that have ticks that are so severe, the principal would have like an iPad on her desk and the child might have an iPad on his desk. So they had like a, a Zoom way and she could 
she could call into him and they had a very good relationship. So usually if she could say a few words to him, that calmed him down or um, he could also ask to go see her. Um, we obviously always try um, to leave the, the kid in the classroom um, as much as possible. Um, I, I think that some people, when they do have to remove a kid for a brief time, whether it's for you know the remainder of the day or just 20 minutes, they also sometimes like almost Skype in um, or do that iPad so that the child can still see the instruction. Um, but it, unfortunately, it's so case by case, it's hard to give a, a definite answer to that. Great, thank you. Okay. Another question we have, I have a student that refuses to do work in math class. He is on, he is in the gr correct grade level, but falling real, falling really far behind. Any suggestions? I would see if, is it in classroom or at, like, does he not want to work in class? I know lots of kids don't want to go up to the board. Um, if he could show that work at some point, you know, obviously kids have got to do homework, um, but trying to work out, could we have a discussion? Could we talk about it if you don't work these problems out? Um, but yeah, when they start to fall behind academically, that is definitely when you want to look for some sort of, uh, of support. So again, um, possibly having a 504 plan um, and, and involving the school, school psychologist, counselor, and the parents. Great, thank you. Would you mind also talking a little bit more about the in-service presentations that we at the TAA host? Um, do you wanna share with the group a little bit about the benefit of those and what that could really do for somebody, um, a child or a student with child syndrome? Yeah, that's a great idea. We definitely, um, we have in-services available to school districts. So sometimes in a situation like this, um, a school reaches out, whether it's a, a teacher, a school psychologist, parents reach out to the Tourette Association, and we do provide in services to the school. Whether um, you know pre-pandemic, we we would some try to meet it, it, as much as possible in the school, um, and then kind of talk about um, Tourette syndrome on the whole, um, and just to educate everybody um, in the school. From there, we can work with just that team that works with the child on a daily basis to come up with strategies and support. So we can definitely do things more individual um, when you reach out to us um, through for our in-service. Angela, what, what am I forgetting? Yep, that's perfect. Um, like Jen said, feel free to reach out to the Tourette Association and you can do so using the email address programs at Tourette.org and we would be happy to set something up, whether it's a school-wide professional development discussion or presentation about Tourette syndrome and overall accommodations, like something that you heard today, or we can, of course, speak with the team that's directly working with the students um, and, and kind of tailor those accommodations to them. And I see a question, and there is no charge for the in-service. We uh, do, do those in cooperation with, our, with the CDC grant, and we're able to provide those free of charge to any school um, or team across the country. So please reach out to us if this is something that you would like. Uh, okay, so now more questions are coming in. Um, what do you recommend if a school has a zero tolerance policy? For example, corporal, using coprolalia or, or things like that. So. Um, or a hitting tick or something. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Or a hitting tick as well i would definitely um look into um a 504 plan because it, you know this is a disability it's it's um documented in, and with the idea you know a child has the right to be in school um you can't you can't take away that right so we've got to find you know you've got to work to put them in the least restrictive um classroom setting as possible um, obviously there are times that it can be distracting and you might have to remove a student, but you're going to have to work, um, because uh, that child has a legal right to be in school. Great. Thank you. Another question we have. I have a student who is twice exceptional. Do you have any suggestions that are specific to supporting an individual who is twice exceptional? That's a good 
part that I left out of this presentation, that there are a, a good deal of students with Tourette syndrome that are on the gifted spectrum and that they are gifted. So um, definitely you want to get those in the in those advanced honors classes. You want to challenge them because that um, they, they want to be they need to be stimulated that way because um, if they're bored in a classroom, you know, it's just going to be even I'm not going to say that they're going to be taking more or anything like that, but they they you definitely just want to um, not focus on the Tourette syndrome and, and leave out the, the gifted aspects. So, yes, I would try to get them in all advanced and gifted classes because that's that's truly where the, the, these kids shine. Great, thank you. Okay, one more question. I know you briefly touched on this, but my son takes breaks, then doesn't want to come back to class. Do you have any suggestions? He's missing a lot of school, and his teacher is frustrated. Sure, that that can definitely. When a kid realizes sometimes, hey, I can get out of, out of the classroom, then it can be difficult to go back. So um, sometimes maybe I had this was a little bit different context, but I had another child um, with a disability and we had to limit things. So you could do this, um, you know, so sometimes it was questions like I will answer any question, but you've only got five this hour, like or three questions. So after he would get to like that, the, the next to the last question, I would say, OK, you know, Adam, this is your fourth question. Are you sure you want to ask this one? You could kind of do something similar with, hey, I understand there's a need to take breaks, but we also have to set a limit, you know, because we have to, you know, that everybody has to do things they don't like. And it, it can be difficult because, um, you know, once you take those breaks, um, you just want more of them or it's easier to stay. I guess finding out um, why he is wanting to stay, take a break. Is it because of the social aspect? Um, is he feeling embarrassed in class or is it just the academic? You know, I'd rather not be in, in the science lecture um, and kind of just you know, kind of getting to the root of that problem, but setting limits might help. Great, thank you so much, Jen. It looks like that's all the questions that we have. So just want to reiterate if something comes up. Oh, just kidding. I have another one for you. <laughs> um, questions are tough, but I like them. Last question. COVID has shown me that my daughter does a lot better doing academics virtually. She, was, she is in high school, but all special ed classes. Can I ask the school to continue services this way and only be, be in school part of the day? Well, you are not alone. I think that there are, I have, as a school counselor, I have spoken to so many parents who, for various reasons, some, some families and child children um, prefer that. I, I, I spoke to one girl whose tics were just better because she was, not in the um, you know the social an anxious situations and she was just at home and so her tics were actually a lot better um, however i i don't i don't know that school will re will remain virtual you know post pandemic um, and if she had if your child has a, an iep I, I don't know what all they would look into but but um, i think that we will, I, I think there will be virtual school at some point, but hopefully soon we will all be back. So I, I just can't answer that. I'm sorry. And it's probably probably situational from school to school. It, you could talk to um, an administrator at the school that, that really probably varies from school to school. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Jen. Okay, that looks like that's all the questions that we have. So thank you so much for another wonderful presentation. As I said earlier, once the webinar is closed, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we'd be very appreciative if you would complete that and provide your feedback. This survey is specific to your experience during the webinar and will help us to improve future programming. You'll also receive the same follow-up email within an hour or so after the webinar with a link to view the recording and the additional instructions on how to go about claiming credit if you'd like, like to do so. Additionally, the webinar will be posted on the TAA's YouTube channel for those who are unable to participate today. We encourage you to reach out to us about this webinar or for other ideas and suggestions you may have. Um, we have another uh, educator webinar coming up at the end of April, Wednesday, April 21st. Please register and join us. 
And um, we also have launched our programming for the 2021 virtual conference that's being held May 14th to 16th. You can visit TouretteConference.org and check out all of the programming and register today. So without further ado, on behalf of the Tourette Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to do our presentation. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, bye. <laughs>